Hi, uh, I'm Anandi, uh, along with Virendra and Muku. Uh, today here we are going to present about uh, how we used and why we used OpenShift in our company, which is ATP CEO, um, which stands for Airline Tariff Publication Company. Uh, as the uh, name goes, we do cater the uh, airline industry. Practically, we are owned by them. Uh, so we are like a neutral body uh, for these airline industries where they enter their uh, fares, their restrictions, and their fee data into our system, and we distribute the data. Uh, our consumers are basically anywhere from the small new airlines to the big old ones, and from Google to Expedia. Um, to know about our company better, we, are about, we have about 434 airlines, which, uh, carriers, which basically work with us. We have about four offices around the world. 99% uh, of the airline data, intermediate data, goes through us. Uh, and we have about 173 million fares in our database. You can see the volume. Um, basically, we have been more than 50 years in this industry. So as you can see, uh, we have been with the airline industry from the day that they started their fares filing in papers uh, to the current day where a single air carrier or an airline can either enter or update about million fares a day. Uh, so you can see again the amount of data that goes through us and how much we process. Um, so uh, as the time goes, we can say how our technology has moved. We have uh, the older technologies on the top and the new technologies that is coming in. Um, Basically, we are in a position most of the time, we are, our unique use case scenarios would be like uh, maybe the requirements of the business needs haven't changed much, and we cannot change the way that we receive or send the data, but our technologies have become outdated and we have to change those technologies. So it's like kind of your remodeling where you cannot change the integrity or the, uh, uh, the behavior of your uh, uh, structures, but you have to modernize them. Um, and, and we are also in a position that uh, our solutions have to be highly reliable and highly available and, uh, uh, and anything, we cannot give anything short of an enterprise solution because any wrong move from us would cost a lot for the airline industry. Uh, having said that, basically we cannot take much of risk in anything. Anything, I mean, we cannot take a lot of risk in introducing new technologies into the company, but at the same time, at ADP, we choose to move towards uh, a, a, a API strategy, and why we have to do that is because, uh, as you know, the airline uh, industry has it, itself become very competitive. Um, we also understand that airline industry, uh, in certain markets, same two carriers, will be very competitive and they have to uh, bring in products and services that are very unique to them. And in, in a different market, uh, the same two carriers have to partnership with each other, where one service is offered by one has to be offered by the other airline as well. So they have to be more collaborative. So in this needs, we have to bring in an innovative and uh, more creative ways of sending out the data so they are, a they are able to be more competitive and collaborative at the same time. And of course, as the term goes now, everything we wanted today or even yesterday. So it is always the fast. We have to push something fast to the market. So like anybody else or, or currently how, are, how people think, we resorted to the microservices architecture. Of course, uh, anything that we want to uh, do, it, uh, do it faster, it has to be more manageable. If you want it to be more manageable, it has to be more smaller. So we break down our monolithic to our microservices architecture, which is very, uh, seems to be very typical these days. Uh, how do we want to do it? Of course, we followed principles of microservices. We did the domain modeling. We re it was not easy. We rewired ourselves in terms of our business thinking and got us changing. Um, somehow, even though it was difficult, we got there. But what we found was monolithic is more structured, organized, and easy to maintain. So in many of the companies, you can typically see that in their lower environments or when they are tinkering or playing, they want to go with microservices. But when they want to really go with a good solution or a solid solution, they go for the monolithic. It's because it's easier to manage. But when you get into microservices, as you can see, your services has exploded and you have a lot of them scattered everywhere. So 
with microservices, also you get a lot of options, how you are going to uh, uh, build them or deploy them or you are going to architect them. Uh, typically, if you see, either you can take, uh, in, in, our, in our case, uh, we go with VMs. So we take a VM, do we want to slash each services into those VMs or we put all uh, t services together in one VM and replicate them into multiple instances or we take a VM, we pick and choose this what services goes where. So although this gives multiple options, it also brings in huge amount of complexity. So the nightmare begins, right? How exactly are we going to um, build it, deploy it, architect it, and maintain it? So what we learn from all these things is if not designed and architected properly, developing and deploying microservices, managing their infrastructure, maintaining and monitoring and troubleshooting them can be challenges. It's simply because microservices is distributed. What do you mean by that? It is scattered, it is everywhere, and soon you can lose everything. You can lose, it can go out of control, and it is harder to manage. Virendra, can you please tell us what are challenges and how do you manage them? Well, literally like this. 18 months back, we started our journey with microservices 18 months back. And when the tools and technologies around the microservices are still evolving, and we don't know much about those. <clears throat> we took one pilot application and it exploded it into 20 services. The question is, how do I manage these services? How do I deploy them? How do I even, should I take one service and deploy it to one VM? Take second service, deploy it to second VM, take third service, should I deploy it to one first VM? Should I deploy it to the second VM? Or should I create a third VM? How do I decide all these things? Should I create an app file like this to maintain what service is running where, in which environment? Is it the right way to do that? We are struggling, and we are looking for a better options. In search of better options, like we experimented with Docker to see if Docker provides any alternative for us. Sure, it can. But what we really wanted was to find a tool which will take my service, it decides, it deploys by itself without us even worrying about the service, where it deploys. And then right around that time, we got introduced to OpenShift by Veer and his team. And they said they could do that. Really. And then we developed a POC and OpenShift did it for us. We don't have to worry anything, worry about anything. And our second challenge was orchestration. How do I orchestrate all these services? How does a service locate another service? We have all these services, multiple instances of these services running around and then how, do, how does the service locate the other service? How do I load balance between these services? How do I manage my external requests to the services? We landed on this uh, initial architecture. We have the FI routing layer, and we introduced the gateway, and we introduced the Spring Cloud technology stack. We have Eureka, we have the config server, and we have the admin server. All of our services are sitting there. Yes, we solved the problem of service discovery and load balancing. But at the same time, we introduced additional components. We have the gateway catering for our external request to the services. And we have the Eureka, which is providing the service discovery. And we have the Netflix ribbon, which is doing the load balancing between the services. But OpenShift solved this problem for us. It has the routing layer, which will route, which will take care of the service, uh, routing the external request to the services. And with the service layer, it solved the uh, service discovery and load balancing for us. Sure, a developer can whip up something easily using microservices. 
but to implement microservices at an enterprise level it needs to be done right what do i mean by that we have to implement or provide all these capabilities to all of our services to get the real benefits out of the microservices sure we can do it by ourselves but it takes time about 80% of these capabilities are provided by openshift out of box we just need to maintain and manage one tool now our developers has more time they can focus on the functional requirements and our ops can focus on maintaining the health of this openshift cluster now that we have more time and a good tool we could do more mukul can you tell us what we did Hi, I'm Mukul Narkarni. Uh, I'm a magician, sorry, developer at ATPCO. And I have a confession. So uh, this is the first time I'm presenting in front of, in a public setting. So when I actually came over here, I was told by somebody, pretend you are Superman on the stage. <laughs> and I will see how that goes. So I'm here to talk about continuous integration and continuous de delivery deployment. So now that we had decided on OpenShift as our uh, enterprise solution. The next, our focus turns on, turned on automation and how we can leverage OpenShift for continuous integration and continuous deployment. I read somewhere that if you say the word CI, CD, in five seconds somebody will see Jenkins. And that was absolutely <laughs> true. The first thought in our mind was Jenkins. And we actually had an external Jenkins in place. So we wanted to take that to the next level. So. We wanted to see how OpenShift and Jenkins will work together. So for that, we had two options. The first option was having the Jenkins master and the Jenkins slave inside of OpenShift. The second option was having the Jenkins master outside OpenShift and provisioning the Jenkins slaves inside of OpenShift. And we chose option two. And that was because we already had an existing system, Jenkins system, that was catering to our application builds. And we did not want to disrupt a setting. But then how would the Jenkins slaves inside of OpenShift talk to this external Jenkins? So for that, again, we had two options at that point of time. So we had a Docker Swarm plugin. And this Docker Swarm plugin enabled the Jenkins slaves inside of OpenShift to, um, uh, to auto-discover the Jenkins master and join it automatically. The second option was Kubernetes Cloud plugin. And that enabled us to dynamically provision the Jenkins slaves inside of OpenShift. So this provides scalability, as well as provides the ability to create Jenkins pods on the fly for specific jobs at, for specific runtimes. And we went with the option two. Because in contrast to the Docker Swarm, the ability of the Kubernetes cloud to spin off this Docker uh, slave or the Jenkins slave and use the, and uh, for run, uh, execute jobs on that particular slave. And once that job is completed, bring the slave down. And that was exactly what we are looking for because we did not want to allocate any resources permanently for these Jenkins slaves. So now that we have the whole setup in place, we have OpenShift, we have Jenkins, we have the Kubernetes Cloud plugin, and we have the other Nexus uh, repositories, we have our Git repositories, all the other yada, yada, yada. So now, our focus turns on, turned on to continuous integration. So for continuous integration, we made use of an OpenShift concept called source to image. Source to image, as the name implies, is basically taking your application source and converting it into an executable, executable Docker image, which you can then deploy later in OpenShift. So it, the source to image process involves taking your application source, building it, and layering it on top of a, of a builder image to create that application Docker image. So what's this builder image? So the builder image is nothing but an image that consists of all the tools, the libraries that are required for your application to build and run. So for example, in our company, we use a Tomcat builder. So this Tomcat builder would have the necessary, uh, uh, it would have the uh, Tomcat, it would have Maven, it would have Java. 
But in addition to that, it would also have our Atypico certificates. It would have the custom configurations required for Atypico. So that makes it, we can basically then reuse it at an enterprise level, ship it across to projects and they can use it. So now we have the builder in place. Let me walk you through this continuous integration with OpenShift. So it all begins when a developer commits code to the Git repository. And using webhooks, the Jenkins uh, server is basically able to initiate the uh, build. So the build, uh, the source will be compiled, then unit test will be, run, uh, will be running on that. And in the end, if all is well, we spawn off a Jenkins executor. And this Jenkins slave that is, or executor that, that uh, we have spawned up now will basically initiate the OpenShift S2I build. And this OpenShift S2I build builds our application source, puts it on top of our, uh, uh, top of our builder image, which can be like a Spring Boot or a Tomcat based on our needs, and then create our builder application image. This output image stream is then deployed into OpenShift and we run functional tests on that. And uh, results of this functional test, result of the unit test are provided as instant feedback back to the developer. So that is how we achieved continuous integration. <coughs> After that, we turned our focus on to continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So for that, we made use of another OpenShift uh, strategy. So that is called OpenShift binary deployment strategy. So what is that? So that is nothing but you are building your application outside of OpenShift. And the resultant war or the jar that is created, you are using that to deploy it in OpenShift at a later stage. To explain that, let me walk you again through this diagram. So when, when we are ready for release, when we have identified our release candidate, the project maintainer is going to trigger a release pipeline. That's going to spawn off this Jenkins executor. And once that is spawned off, it's, we basically implement Git flow, so it will do all the relevant tagging of the repository, versioning, and then creating the release branch. We check out the release branch, and we use, the we use that code to build and run the unit test. We will uh, do the code quality, sonar tools, and everything. And if all is well, in this case, we will take the resultant war or the jar and push it to Nexus. And then we would initiate again the S2I build with one difference. Now this S2I build would basically use the image that we have pushed to Nexus, get that, uh, use the war or the jar that is pushed to Nexus, get that, create our app output image stream, the application output image stream, and push it back to Nexus. And then if, once it is in Nex Nexus, it is available for all the uh, environments below to be deployed. So it's going to, we are going to deploy it into dev, move it across the different environments, QA, UAT, and then to prod. And in prod, we have configured a rolling deployment. So that means when we deploy it to prod, there is no outage to the users. So that is in effect how we achieved CI and CD with uh, OpenShift and Atypico. Now, I literally compressed a year and a half's worth of work in like six, seven minutes right now. So if you have any questions, clarifications, you can reach out to all of us. We will be here at the conference here today and the next three days at the Red Hat Summit. And so now that we have achieved continuous integration and continuous delivery deployment, what's next, Anandi? Automating the infrastructure? Why not? Um, why not? Um, Basically, OpenShift offers us to uh, scale, auto-scale, meaning uh, when there is an increase in the volume of the request, the number of pods it is going to spin is going to come up, and if it goes down, it goes down. Uh, but any time uh, when it keeps on spinning the pods, you're going to run out of the nodes, the physical resources. So when a, when a new node has to be added to the cluster, it is not automated. At that point, we have to figure out a VM and then provision it into OpenShift, which is kind of the currently is a manual process. In future, what you want to do is we want to take the benefit of the other side. Uh, go ahead, automate. Uh, we are starting, but we are early on. Our roadmap, we, in our roadmap, we want to automate our infrastructure uh, part as well, uh, so that we are able to create a VM uh, user, uh, using our Ansible scripts in the playbook. 
So once a VM is created, automatically we could use Cloud Forms to, use, uh, to provision this particular the node created into the OpenShift automatically without us going and uh, trying to add a node to a cluster. Uh, so this is our future uh, roadmap, and this is the direction that we want to move. Uh, just to summarize uh, what we have been saying so long, uh, why OpenShift in ADP Go, uh, is that if you are like us who believe in uh, you know, microservices, CI, CD, DevOps, uh, and really it's very difficult to take and implement because as developers it's easy in development environment, but then to take it as an enterprise solution, uh, the challenges begins for us, and if we took OpenShift help to get, the, get us quickly there, uh, so that there are a lot of skeptics in your company that would say, oh, this is not possible for us, uh, these, these terminologies are gimmicks and it works only for uh, companies like uh, uh, Netflix or Facebook or Google and not like a company like us where we, have, uh, where we need to provide uh, enterprise solution on day one and we are not startup to try out and uh, fail. Uh, so this helped us and it made us to ca carry on faster to prove to our company that indeed these things are possible for us and we can think uh, microservices as a better solution for an API strategy to be a better solution for our company. Uh, of course, uh, it is hard for red and blue to work together, but in our case, it worked out. Thank you.